C had a meeting, and they talked about, um, with the help of Mr. Miles, the SAC has kind of sort of become the, the governing body of the school. Um, they're not going to have any curriculum decisions, but what they're going to do is like, they're going to discuss. They're going to make. They're going to discuss the rules and make the rules, sort of with the help of the faculty and the, and the student, sort of a student-teacher sort of organization thing, so that the SAC now, will sort of, help with the rules of the school. Um, today we talked about. There was a meeting today, and we discussed a um, pep rally Friday. It will be. It, it, I guess what's going to happen is there's going to be an assembly schedule on Friday so that the um, pep rally will be able to have time to have a pep rally for like half hour, 45 minutes before people take off for their states and stuff. There'll be all the, all the teams that are going to be in the states um, so far. Um, speaking of states, sports, the track states I believe are Saturday. Um, swimming are Monday. Diving is Friday evening, girls and boys, and the girls and boys swimming is Monday together at Bowdoin. Um, winter Carnival. <coughs> winter Carnival went really well. It was, pretty, uh, it was fun. It wasn't as big a turnout this year as we had last year, but uh, it, it was really success it was It was fun. Uh, freeze. I'm not, I, don't know, I don't know if you're aware of the freeze situation, but now all seniors have freeze. Were you aware of that by any chance? Uh, Rob Tinsman, James Davis, and Lisa Bitterman uh, came up with a sort of a, a discussion. They talked to Mr. Miles about how seniors should have freeze uh, instead of just instead of getting C's or better because they feel that you know seniors could have the responsibility. So they put together a, a big letter and had meetings and everything and. They discussed with the teachers about having freeze for the, all the seniors. So that, that has been, as far as I know, that has been going well. Um, the biggest concern was people leaving school and so forth. And stuff like that's going to happen. And if that happens, then the school is going to penalize those people who leave the school instead of the whole, everyone with the freeze. Um, and the last thing is the new schedule. The new schedule is going really well. I, I find it. I think it was, it was well done, put together. Uh, Brian, I have a question. What, uh, I need to know why the students should have freeze. I mean, I, I, I take, but my view is they're going to school and after school's out, they're, they're free. Well, students should have freeze because being the day that it, this no freeze sort of gets into the curriculum. <clears throat> having a long day in school and having to go to class from class to class, right back to back, you know, sort of a freeze, a good break in a day for a student, just to relax, go in and play some ping pong, just sit back, go to the library, talk to some friends. You know, it's it's a good break before they go to their next class, because some people have have really tough, you know, tough. It's also good for Say if you want to prepare for a test and you didn't have time to prepare for it that evening and you have a free before your class, you can use that as a sort of a study period, to say. It's basically, freeze are just to a break in the day. And do, do I understand you say that all seniors have freeze? All seniors have freeze. If they have a study hall. If it's they have a study hall. In place of a study yep. hall. Correct. There used to be, I believe, if I understand correctly, there were mandatory study halls yes. for seniors who did not maintain a certain exactly. grade Exactly. You, you, you had to have C's or better, I'm sorry, B's or better, and you could have C's with an effort mark of three in order to get it free. That's what's going on with juniors right now. Juniors have that. We used to have that until they decided to... to have freeze, and I think it was a right, great so, idea. So, so there's no grade requirement anymore. Everybody's entitled to freeze. Everybody has freeze until they <coughs> screw up. Well, free. they may have no freeze if they have a schedule that's that's very taxing. They may not have what normally would be a study hall. Exactly. Now they no longer have to go to a supervised study hall. They can use that period of time the way they want to use it, whether it's going to the senior lounge or, or working in the library or. Is, is that? Yep. How many, do exactly. some people have more than one free? 
Some people, yes, have like two frees in a day. That just happens to be because they don't, I guess they're done, maybe a half year was over. But you, that's, that's, that's rare, usually. Because now seniors are finding that they need courses now to graduate, which happened to me. I needed a course to graduate, so I'm down to one free. But, I mean, there's those people who do have two frees, but then there's, it's not really, it's, pre, it's not really a high probability that they do, but there are those people who do have them. But they stay in the school, is that right? Person? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And then those people who have freeze at the beginning of the school, like the first period of the day, they can apply for early, early dismiss, early arrival, late dismissal in the afternoon. Or uh, they can leave if they have the freeze at the end of the day, then they can have a shortened school day. Yep. They can. You know, <laughs> I, 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 the reason I'm asking these questions, Brian is that I told the school board this, or a prior school board, I remember back in 1970 or 71, when I happened to go to a school board meeting here, and the issue was uh, that everybody should be able, all seniors should be able to have a schedule where they can move the freeze into the end of the day and go home early. And uh, I was, Concern then, and I, Frank, I tell you, I don't think my, the, I don't know whether other people the board share my concern, but we don't spend a, we, we we talk about longer school days, we talk about longer school years, we talk about American students falling behind uh, uh, kids in Japan. This has been talked about in American education over the last three or four years, and it's interesting, against the background of that discussion, that. We're now having a discussion about making arrangements so that kids can leave school early. It, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you to respond. I'm just telling you why. You may say to yourself, what's he asking me all these questions for? And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, that is why I'm asking uh, all the questions. We, asked that we, we lengthened the school year last year. And now we're talking about uh, the fact that we ought not to have the kids maybe so long because it's a long uh, grueling day that's a subject for another that's that's a subject for discussion another day we're not going to do it tonight but uh, I hope if there are parents that are looking on television who are interested in this issue and want to know why the school board lengthens the school day and the Department of Education is talking about lengthening the school year that we have the kind of discussion wow. we had tonight sure but these people who these people have a free at the afternoon I mean they're getting they have all, they're getting all their curriculum throughout the day. They're getting a full school day. I mean, they're getting their 70 minute period and so forth. I mean, I don't understand, I don't know what would be the concern if, the, if they go home early. They're still getting their education that everyone else is getting. They just happen, luckily, that they have a free at the end of the day. And that doesn't happen every day because of their rotation schedule. But, uh, I don't Any know. Other I, would you tell them about the assembly today? I think that the public would like to know what happened this morning. Oh, Senator George Mitchell. That's right. How could I forget that? <laughs> <laughs> Senator George Mitchell came came in today. He, I guess the Senate is not in session, and so he's making appearances around schools and so forth. And he came in today, and he there was an assembly, and he was really, he was a wonderful speaker, and he spoke about abortion about you know he, he took people's questions and and uh, you know answered them and it was amazing how he answered the questions I mean people would ask him questions sort of like to see how he'd respond and he just totally put them down with his well not put them down but he totally answered them so they were like you know sitting in their seats staring at him but I thought it was I thought it was great and it's good for him to do that I I went to that meeting today, or went to the assembly, and I was very proud of Cape Elizabeth High School. There, there were 500 students sitting in those seats, and, and I, I didn't see anybody talking. I didn't see anybody moving. It would have been a challenge for any uh, newspaper group or uh, reporters to have done a better job of questioning him. Every issue that I was interested in, our student body brought up, and I'm sure that he was uh, very pleased to be at our high school, and I was very proud of, of, of our students. It was a, a really a class morning, and that's a pun, but I really mean it. It was they were they were just top notch. What can we say?
<laughs> Any other questions of Brian? No, thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, next item is a report by the superintendent on his uh, trip to Cornell. And just by way of uh, background, uh, the superintendent has uh, indicated uh, uh, that he is going to, from time to time uh, over the next few years, travel to a, a variety of colleges and talk to admissions people uh, for two reasons. One, so that he gets a feel for what admissions people at various schools are thinking about. But secondly, and more importantly, to show the flag of Cape Elizabeth High School. These admissions people remember that the superintendent of schools in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, uh, came to visit them. And it's very, very important in the admission process. When they see an applicant from Cape Elizabeth, that they say, hey, this is a hotshot school system. The superintendent took the time uh, to come and visit our admissions department. They're really serious about college admissions. Darrell? Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to make uh, just one comment to Brian's remarks. Uh, uh, having started the sort of college circuit, uh, in six months, you won't be calling this freeze. You'll be calling it how to plan your time for 24 hours a day to remain at the college you got accepted to. And uh, I would hope that this is an opportunity uh, to learn how to plan that time for you. Uh, basically, I really enjoyed my trip to Cornell. Uh, they were quite surprised to see a superintendent visiting. And I was given what is called the red carpet. Uh, Fortunately, the uh, young person who represents our main students also represents the better private schools in New England. And fortunately for us, she happens to be from Maine. And uh, like everything political this year, everybody who is anybody seems to come from Maine. And uh, it makes it a lot easier for us. But I've uh, given the board more detail, but just for the sake of the parents, so you get some appreciation. Uh, I was taken through the complete process uh, where some 22,000 applications occupy four rooms. And uh, they're put together and then sent to the variety of departments. Around 6,000 of those applicants are accepted and only three enter. Uh, there are basically three things to admissions in Cornell, and I'm sure that this is similar to others. Uh, first, uh, the students' grades and the SAT test. And the tests are to see if the grades are supported. One thing that uh, I couldn't help but notice that came up time after time if honor courses are given in the school, it's extremely important that the student take some of those. Not all of those, but some of those. And that, uh, they think, is an indication of motivation. The second part is the essay and the letters of recommendations. And here, a person can very easily be dismissed you can imagine with 22,000 applications, something has to be quite unique about an essay to jump out to the reader. Uh, Cornell is an interesting place. Uh, for example, it's an oriented uh, research school. And if a young uh, student showed some aptitude for research, they would notice that. However, <coughs> There are other things as well. Uh, first of all, there are uh, the instructional needs of the university. And those uh, range from lacrosse to hockey to a bassoon player to legacies. And it was interesting to me that if two students were equal, the legacy, of course, would get it. But if there was one iota of a non-legacy, that person would beat the legacy. And uh, that, of course, uh, doesn't uh, endear the alumni uh, in terms of funds. However, they're the third largest endowed school, I think, in the country. So they aren't too worried about that. Uh, also, we're competing 
uh, in for with Cornell. With schools in New York, such as the Bronx High School of Science, Scarsdale, and Peter Stuyvesant, where two to three hundred of those youngsters are taken every year. All in all, uh, I think it was a very worthwhile trip, first for the superintendent, and I'm hopeful for our students in the future, and I've uh, given the board a profile of what really happens in terms of all the departments. My next trip will be to Dartmouth. And uh, we have some youngsters who applied there. Thank you, uh, uh, Darrell. In the context of your statement, uh, the statement they made to you that they look for advanced placement as an indication of the motivation of student, can you assure us now that if a student is so motivated, they can gain admission to advanced placement courses? Yes. Yes, I think I can. Any other? You mentioned in your uh, your brief to us that, that Cornell caters to three or four New York schools. By caters, did, did you mean they have an affiliation with them, or well, uh, why are three or four hundred students from those schools getting in? And well, if that's true, then how could somebody cater to us other than, I mean, the University of Maine? But it, it seems like there's there's some sort of an affinity there, and it would. And, and we Quite could be similar. working towards something like that ourselves at some fine schools that had a, a great respect for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I got the feeling, and of course, you know, I can't, I'm not certain of this, but I got the feeling that Cornell uh, is uh, considered by some of the better or more prestigious high schools as a state school. And for years, those three schools, particularly the Bronx High School of Science and Scarsdale, you know, uh, that's uh, sort of an entree for the New York youngsters, as well as, the, of course, the New York system. Of course, I think Cornell would be far more prestigious than uh, the SUNY system at Plattsburgh, for example, or Binghamton. Is it a state York. school? No, but I think it's perceived that way, you see. And I think they cater to, of course, the New York students. The bulk of those students are going to come from New York. I think that, that there is the, the, I think I think probably the agricultural school there is is land grant and does get uh, federal and state aid. You know, a lot of these schools are perceived that way, and like uh, Yale is the school of New Haven, well, you know, our, state school of New Haven. Are Bates or Bowdoin or Colby considered to, to have some kind of affiliation with Maine? Bowdoin does. I can tell you this that that kids from Maine uh, have a slight <coughs> leg up at Bowdoin. Uh, Bowdoin tries to take a certain number of kids uh, from Maine every year, and, and, and it views itself as a school that tries to provide opportunity to Maine students. So I think if you had all things being equal, a student from Maine, a student from Massachusetts, and they were equal in every other respect, and they didn't have enough kids from Maine and Bowdoin, the kid from Maine would get in. Uh, I don't know about the other schools. I don't think that's true at, uh, at Bates and Colby. So I don't think those relationships are, are formalized either. And I think they're apt to change. For example, one of the things that I noticed at Cornell, and the guidance pe people tell me the same, there's a sort of impression uh, of the main student and wor the work ethic. Uh, North Carolina is a good example. And where that's rumored that main students, you know, are very hard workers, that sort of gets around. And that helps us in a few places in the country already. Uh, whoever started that rumor, and whether it's true or not, I don't know. But uh, I suspect it probably is. I thought you went to Cornell because our track record was poor. Wasn't that one of the schools that you chose Hard. to go to because, Very difficult because to we, we the, had several the, applying and no one getting in? The first four that I'm doing this year are where our track record is not good. Well, it wasn't good until it's starting to change. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to Princeton. I thought I'd do that very late in the year. <laughs> Any other questions, Daryl? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Daryl. The next 
item you would report to us on is the facility needs. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we've had two meetings now on school organization. And we're planning another, uh, hopefully, the last hearing on the uh, reorganization on February the 27th. And at that time, hopefully, I can make a final report on um, the technicalities of next year. But this evening, I'd like to recommend what we're going to need for facilities, regardless of how we organize the elementary and the middle school, because of the numbers and the bulge of our population running through the schools. And my re firm recommendation, and uh, we need all the time we can get to make this possible for next year, is that I'm recommending a portable 70 by 70 that would cost approximately $175,000. Again, this would hopefully be purchased by the town. I've, t I've spoken with the town manager, and we would lease it and get state aid and would pay for the building over a period of approximately 5.5 years. Now, we would place this portable uh, between the old high school, the middle school, and the new addition to the middle school. And that would mean that we would limit the parking there. However, we're suggesting a new traffic pattern, and the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is that when we go to the zoning board and the planning board, that's the first thing they're going to say. You've taken 18 slots, what are you going to do about them? Uh, the business manager has been working with the town manager on parking. And D, uh, could, could we show the board uh, where we're going to replace that? It's very small, but I think uh, knowing you know the area, you will know where we plan to do. Building. Can, I, can everybody in the audience oh, see, see that? that? I mean, you may be too far away. At least, can you see the board? You see the Okay. The building would be uh, situated next to the old section, like Daryl said, and the gym doors, 70 by 70. We'd still leave enough room in that area so that we could have uh, doors to exit or enter from on either side. But like uh, Dr. Pelletier also mentioned, this would take like 18 parking spaces away from the present grounds. What? Uh, the architect, Bob Armitage, is working on is proposing to take the strip down Pond Cove, Van, Lunt, and Middle School, have the traffic come in to, through the Scott Dyer, and exit right away for the uh, parents. The buses could still use that same route to come around. Down the end, towards the Lunt building, we would take some of that strip away and make a parking lot there approximately 18 to 24 cars. Down by the bus garage, which is situated in this corner, there's a strip of land here between the road and the ball field, and possibly we could make a strip or a parking spaces there of another 15 to 20 cars. And try to get the traffic away from Scott Dyer in this loop and have the people leave this open, and have the people park in here and in here. Okay, so that the, the, right now, if you go down past the bus garage heading to the Holman Field, there's a strip of grass between the backstop and the pavement, and you would uh, eliminate that strip of grass and bring the pavement right up to the fence that outlines... No, not that far in here. We go about probably 15 feet, 20 feet in, just a long strip, just enough for the cars to go in, period. Well, I uh, understand the cars were parked there, right? Yeah. Um, but so you have a, you have that uh, you have that the the uh, plaque on a brick pedestal for Mr. Holman. You'd have to move that back. Yeah, there's a pedestal there that says this is named in honor of Derwood Holman, and it has a nice plaque there. And you'd have to take that out. Uh, I know you don't have too many options, and you have to have the parking. Uh, I'm concerned about it. I think that. Uh, I hope that we'll get some input, frankly, from the public on this, because it's their school grounds and it's a nice appearing campus atmosphere now, and uh, 
I'm, I hope that it'll still appear uh, to be a nice appearing cap campus atmosphere after you're over with, but I suspect that uh, you're going to see just a lot more cars squeezed into what was the mall area. Uh, I don't know what the alternatives are, and I don't propose that we sit here all night and discuss the alternatives. Yeah, I don't believe parking was absolutely the major consideration in studying the various alternatives, and I don't think we ought to leave the public with the impression that uh, that's where we started or ended. Uh, this represents the lowest cost alternative, and in a very tight budget year, that's very important. Uh, it does present some administrative problems, as Dr. Pelletier said, and we're confident that uh, there are a couple of alternatives that will be satisfactory, satisfactorily worked out. Uh, but uh, it certainly wasn't the parking, wasn't where we started. One thing, just for the sake of the people who haven't read the reports or don't have them, is the portable 70 by 70 would be divided in two sections. The first section would be a media section, very similar to the one at Pond Cove. That's proved to work very nicely. And the next uh, section would be the uh, computer center, where the entire school, both the intermediate school and the middle school upper youngsters could use that media center and the computer center. That would free up five classrooms that are already in that new addition. And those five classrooms, if our population holds, would allow us to probably go five years and then we take another hard look at uh, what's happening to the demography of the, this community before the community makes a decision to spend a terrific amount of money. And we're hopeful that <coughs> we, we see is a lessening of the population. And if our guesstimates are correct, uh, in uh, five years we should see a diminishment in the enrollments in this community in terms of the schools. Now that's the best picture we have at the present time. So I would ask the board, uh, we would need some consensus to move immediately because we have to go to the town council, the planning board, and the zoning board, uh, get the architects going, the builder, and a host of the things that we did last year. And Dee uh, would like to start that schedule as soon as possible because, as you know, that's very time consuming. And uh, invariably, and I want to say this as nicely as I can, uh, the planning board have, has a habit of asking for a great deal of detail. And uh, we would hope to at least plan for two meetings with them. And we can, at best, you know, they have one a month. Last year, we were fortunate they did do a couple specials for us. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the board would like to have the planning, the school board would like to have planning board uh, input on this. Uh, I guess that relates to what I said uh, earlier. Uh, is there a motion to authorize the superintendent uh, to begin moving ahead on the plan that he has described uh, to us in workshop sessions? Yeah. So moved. Is there a second? The motion has been made and seconded that the superintendent uh, be authorized to proceed uh, with a plan that would involve purchasing portable classrooms for uh, installation in the parking area uh, between the middle school gym and the old high school, I call it, still the middle school again, uh, and to, uh, to continue with plans for the architect uh, to relocate some of the parking that would be lost. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand. All opposed? Five to nine. All right, the next uh, item is superintendent's report on curriculum uh, workshop. We have met uh, twice with the new director of <coughs> curriculum, Michael Efron, uh, to find out from him what some of the ideas he has are for uh, ultimately revamping in curriculum in the Cape Elizabeth schools K through 12. Over the past two or three years, <coughs> the most often heard complaint about the school system 
was that the curriculum was disjointed and sometimes uh, unimaginative and uh, that the, the, the scope and sequence, as educators say, was out of kilter. So we have, uh, we have heard, we had a workshop, we heard from uh, the new curriculum director about his ideas, both procedurally as to how to proceed with his work, what he would uh, uh, study and uh, how the, the process he would engage in in coming up with the answers and implementing them, and also the substance of the recommendations that he was working toward. As, uh, during the first meeting, uh, the school board at this workshop, and incidentally, uh, uh, every, every member of the public is always welcome at, uh, at workshop sessions. At the first workshop, the board, uh, each of us, gave Mike, Michael Efron our views as to, you know, what we thought he was on target and where we thought he was off target. He took that input from the uh, school board and made some changes to his plan. We had a subsequent workshop session just a couple of weeks ago uh, and went over this, uh, the, the new uh, uh, modified uh, plan of uh, procedure and substance. And uh, I think now the superintendent uh, wants to report to the public on that. Yes, thank you. Uh, the uh, final draft, called draft five, has been completed, and the board has analyzed this thoroughly. And uh, I would hope that uh, we would send uh, copies of this to the public library and uh, to uh, our own libraries. And if there's anyone interested in reading the process of curriculum for the next few years, uh, certainly we'd make that available. First, I want to say, because the next item on the agenda is going to occupy all of our time, including the board, until something like May 30th. I'm extremely pleased to... That's the budget, in case they don't have an agenda. Yeah, go ahead. I'm extremely pleased to have seen the work of a school committee working closely with the administration on the more important aspects of the school system. I, I think uh, we've been blessed this year. I would hope that this would continue. It's been <clears throat> my experience, my long experience, I hate to say, that so much of our time has been spent on buildings and finances and parking lots and all of the things that don't count. But this year, if you look back at the decisions that have been made, They've been made uh, very close to the instructional line, and I'm very pleased, and this is a perfect example. Uh, <clears throat> not only was the board thoroughly involved, but large numbers of teachers and administrators. So I just want to say how pleased I am. Uh, <clears throat> that's all I'm going to say at this point in time. <clears throat> I would hope to make a report to the board <clears throat> next month on the organization of the schools and how we plan to uh, operate for the next few years, providing the board goes along with it. So uh, I just want to sort of put uh, draft five, after an awful lot of work on a, from a lot of people, sort of to bed and uh, have it available for those people that would like to see it. Uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman, if Michael would like to say a couple words. Yeah, before Michael, uh, if Michael does want to say uh, a couple of words, uh, huh? He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't want to say a couple of words. All right. <laughs> are we? Uh, are we uh, chiseling this one in stone? This. Uh, what, do you want, what do you want us to do with this now? This draft number five. Well, I, I, but I don't think anything is in stone. I would think that we would have some consensus that this is the uh, process and the approach that we would use, and we would, uh, from time to time, review it to make very certain this is the way we want to go. And it's preliminary to the budget. Now, this will all come up again at the budget time because we will have budget figures on this process. And I would hope that at that point we could recommend how much of the, uh, the process we want to attempt next year what the priorities are and how much it's going to cost. 
Uh, we've had our first meeting of the budget today. And uh, as you know, we are taking out a curriculum section. Uh, we will be able to tell you when you come to the budget table uh, the, the cost of all of the administration of this school system, the cost of the curriculum of this school system, and the cost of special education. And I think this year I'm almost certain that we will have every program on a cost basis. So that you could say uh, gifted intelligence costs so much, special education costs so much, the uh, request we're making for curriculum would be X amount of dollars. And then I would hope that we could start, and this has taken three years, now that we have that, we can take a look at cost-benefit analysis. And then we can ask certain questions. Where do we want to place the highest priority? What are our goals? Where do we want to put our money? And what do we want to delete? And I think this is probably the first time for a while that you'll be able to see if you deleted what you delete. And uh, that's the way we're looking at the budget this year. And it's that sophisticated, I'm very pleased. And I think you'll be very pleased. You'll be able to say, this is where we're putting our money, this is where we're not putting. Uh, well, what, I guess what you're saying is draft five, which is the, of the process for curriculum review and development, uh, is a draft that you want us to adopt as a working paper. That's it fair. is not policy of the school board. It is not that we're not saying, okay, let's do uh, precisely what it says in here. And we're certainly not saying, let's spend the money uh, that, 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 that goes with this. We're saving that, right? For the, we will, you will determine that at budget time now, against other alternatives. Because you have to weigh, you'll have to weigh other requests along with this. Uh, uh, for, in order to create the proper context for discussion, can I have a motion that we adopt draft five uh, as a working paper for guidance of the school board as it proceeds through this maze of curriculum change. So moved. Motion's been made and seconded. Now, discussion. When do we meet with you again, Michael? We do have more workshops on this, is that correct? Have, have we set a date? Yes, well, I thought we had, and I, and, I, and I tell you, and I know specifically one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the interrelationships of the supervising positions in curriculum with uh, other responsibilities that teachers, uh, teachers have, including stipend positions. Of course, th those will all be discussed what? at budget time. Right. I was hoping that, that there would be a separate meeting now <coughs> To, just, to discuss curriculum apart from the meeting when we discuss organizational patterns. This, I understood the workshop mm. to be 7 p.m. on Monday the 27th to be curriculum. Maybe I'm... Yeah. I thought that was the organization. We, I, I have it as both administration and curriculum. And I don't see why we couldn't have it as both. In other words, uh, we could take the first hour or so for a curriculum and the second for organization. Okay. okay. Very good. They're so closely tied that you can't really divorce them. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion to adopt this as an underlined working paper. Say to five, raise your hand. All opposed. Five to nothing. The uh, next item are... Uh, for the edification of the public, the dates that the school board will be dealing with uh, budget items. And um, is it your intent just to run through this these dates? Uh, just uh, to do two things, to uh, sort of keep you uh, apprised of what's happening around us, that I don't think I have to do that, but uh, I'm just pulling everything I can. For example, uh, in the last two days, you've heard of budgets from Wyndham. 
which came in at 14.4% increase. And you'll note that their problem was very similar to ours. Uh, instead of 22% increase in state evaluation, they were 24 and they lost state aid. Ours is 27, we're losing state aid. You, I'm sure you've followed what's happening in Portland and in South Portland and in Saco and in New York. So uh, also I'd like to say that- it's an Incidentally, while you're on that subject now, we ought not to get carried away by that 14% in Wyndham until we find out whether the total dollar growth in valuation, and therefore tax dollars, is more or less than Cape Elizabeth. I know the answer to that. <laughs> then why do we have to find it out? Right. I want him to would, find would it out. Would you like to tell us? <laughs> sure. I mean, Wyndham is, in terms of valuation, uh, uh, probably the fastest growing uh, place in the state of Maine. That's right. So revenues in Wyndham are growing rapidly. Well, I wanted to bring up one other point. Uh, this is the first time since uh, I've been back in Maine that I've seen such coalitions for property tax relief. Uh, we are having the third meeting in Kennebunk in two weeks. And at the present time, uh, that coalition is from Kennebunk to Bangor and Brewer. And uh, this was pretty much started by COG and a group of people on the Tax Reform Committee. And I, I'm very pleased because I'm on that committee and they've worked hard diligently for two years. And I'm hopeful that they've got the ear of the legislature. And hopefully, uh, I'm on the legislative committee of the superintendents and I'll be able to report to you if, the, if it appears that there'll be some kind of relief. And if there is, that should be very beneficial. And outside of that, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say these are the final dates. We've started <coughs> our process today. If there are any changes, we should know it at this point. Any, anybody want any changes to the dates? The dates, to, is there any way to, uh, to kind of uh, put somewhere the dates of these uh, budget meetings so the public knows uh, when they are? Huh? We, library? A lot of people don't go to the library. Can put it in newspaper? Keep Keep it, can we put it in that terrific newspaper? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, we could put it in the courier. Quite honestly, the, the place where I find uh, we get the best coverage is the, the newspaper, but the elementary newsletter, which goes home about twice a month at least, is probably the best place to put it. I might, all, I might also do suggest we put it on television. Yeah. We have the scroll that we can right. do that and have it run continuously. Right, we can do that. That might be worthwhile. Yeah. And this is, uh, incidentally, this is still another reason why we have got to have a bulletin board uh, for community services and school announcements because uh, the most pervading institutions in the community for community activities are schools and community services. And we don't have any way of communicating on a mass basis with the citizens of this town. And I can't tell you the number of people that say, well, I didn't know that you were having school board meetings, or I didn't know that you were having budget meetings and all of these important decisions are made at your budget meetings. It's absolutely critical, and we've got to take care of that. And I know that there are people on the town council that will want to help us uh, take care of that. Now, before we uh, move on beyond the budget, these budget dates are all right. Uh, I just want to uh, th thank the superintendent for sending us the uh, booklet called Tracking in Secondary Schools. I found it a little difficult to read because it has all those research slash educational terms and jargon, and it does, it is difficult to read. No, Mr. Chairman, I've got to explain something to you. That, uh, that just arrived. You requested that from the RAND Corporation. We ordered it, and I just sent you the only copy we had. Oh, no. they didn't get it? No, 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 because we haven't had a chance. It just right. came to, to right. make copies. This, what I'd like to do, here's what I'd like to do, and then you all could disagree, I know you're not reluctant to disagree. This was, this is the person who did a history, a, did a historical perspective of tracking. 
it first caught my eye because it said tracking started as a way to uh, segregate Eastern European immigrants, the children of Eastern European immigrants, from the general Anglo-Saxon population of the schools back around the turn of the century. Naturally, that stimulated further inquiry on my part. <laughs> uh, I glanced through the book. I, maybe we can photocopy. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll photocopy this and send it to you. What I would like to do, we don't, we don't have enough school board meetings where we where we uh, discuss for a half an hour or 45 minutes uh, with the public here uh, some of our ideas about the real important educational issues. And I would like to have a discussion before I get off the school board uh, about the issue of tracking. Have uh, administrators and teachers uh, talk to us about it because I think it is a fundamental issue one way or the other. It has a big impact. And uh, w would you all be amenable to putting that on the agenda at some point? I would, but wouldn't it be a better workshop uh, topic? A little more, uh, less formal? Well, it would, except that I think there are quite a few people that watch on television, and I think uh, this is an issue that affects a lot of people in the town. And I'd like to somehow, I don't know whether you can do it in a workshop, I, I, I'd like to give it as much sunshine as possible, Frank. Mm -hmm. Or a televised workshop on it. Maybe we could do that and publicize it a little. Could we do that? We could could televise the workshop. We could pick the right night. Why don't we look into that? It's a good idea. Whether we can have a televised workshop, have administrators and teachers speaking on uh, the issue, and Advertise it a little because a lot of people want to know about this. Okay, will you get back to me in uh, in a week or so on that? Sure. What we can do? Could we have the yep. track room report? Yeah. Uh, also, we'd be more than happy to give you uh, additional uh, reports on that. There was a report last year that uh, uh, was written nationally by uh, the superintendent of Cape Elizabeth and the principal of the Pond Cove School. We'll add that kind of material to it on tracking. And I'm sure that we have other articles we could put together for you. Do, uh, yeah, do that. I think, it, well, I think we have to have a substantive airing of the issue. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the next uh, item on the agenda is public discussion uh, uh, on subjects of anyone's choosing. Now, I know that there are a lot of people here to speak on the uh, homestay program. Uh, issue. I think the way we'll do this is when we get to the report on the homestay program, uh, which will be uh, coming up in five or ten minutes, we'll get that report and then we'll have uh, input from the public right after the report on that issue and then discussion by uh, the school board on that issue. So what I'd like to do now <coughs> is to have uh, anyone come forward who wishes to discuss something other than the homestay program and, uh, and tell us uh, what's on your mind and what your concerns are. You can come, come right up here and use the microphone. And if you could just uh, identify yourself. I'm Kathy Carollo and I have written a letter to Mr. Pacius and I have sent a copy to each of you. Did, did you all get the copy of the letter from Mrs. Crawl? Yeah. Um, I'm here this evening to ask all of you if the school has a policy written stating the procedure that teachers are to follow when a child is injured in school. I ask this question because my son was injured last month. He was thrown down a flight of stairs, had blurred vision and a headache, and I was not called and he did not see a nurse. So I would appreciate a response from the board. All right. have, Mr. Superintendent, have you spoken with Mrs. Corrado about this? On uh, two or three occasions. That's uh, correct. 
and, and Mr. Crow. And Mr. Crow, is there a policy uh, with respect to injuries at school and what what is done in response to those? There's a very sophisticated procedure on the elementary level that uh, is written up and diagrammed and runs through a host of people, including the nurse, the principal, and uh, the part-time administrators. On the middle school level, I'm not sure, I don't think we have a, a uh, policy, a written policy. And on the high school level, uh, we have a nurse and a half up there, uh, and, and then the, I'm sure there, anything around athletics, would they'd have a policy. But uh, let me ask the, the, the principal if there's any kind of written policy on the high school level for what constitutes an emergency, what they do. I know uh, we, use, uh, we use the core a great deal. Let me see if I get your question right. Do we have a policy that specifies what is a critical injury or what we will do if there is a critical I injury? I think both. both. Yeah, the answer is yes, uh, we, we have a, a, an administrative procedure that the nurses have developed, uh, and I think it applies to all the schools, um, whereby um, if a teacher is involved in or observes an injury to a student um, and has concerns about the health of that student, if a student fell down the stairs, if a student were injured in a physical education class, if a student were injured in any other uh, situation that was uh, an injury that looked like it needed some professional medical attention or might need some. There is a procedure of, of notifying the principal and or the nurse, since we have part-time nurses, the nurses are not always there, who would in turn contact a rescue squad um, or if it were not an emergency of that sort, but, but in a sense the student looked all right, seemed all right, um, but we felt, for example, if there were a risk of a hand injury, we would call a parent and, and, and ask the parent to have the child see a physician immediately, perhaps come to school, pick the child up, take them to the hospital, if it were a situation such as that. So there is a process uh, that we think addresses the issue of emergency medical care. Obviously, uh, if it were a serious injury, we have had such an injury already this year in the high school. We've had several, but we've had one where a student did fall down the stairs, rescue was called, student did go to Maine Medical Center, parents were notified, nurse was right on the, right on the spot. So that has, in, in, in fact, been tried at the high school. Does that answer your question? Very well. Now, uh, as I understand what happens, we rely on the judgment of either an administrator or a teacher to talk to the child and to make hopefully a reasoned judgment uh, as Excuse to whether. Excuse me, please. Um, this is one of my points. Um, teachers are there to teach, and it's not their responsibility to assess medical problems or injuries or illnesses. And in the absence of a nurse, the parent must be called. And you just said that the middle school has nothing in, in writing a policy that should be followed. No, no I, I didn't say that. I said I don't know whether the middle you school don't does. Know. However, the principal's here and he knows. As Mr. Miles has pointed out, the uh, policy that is in existence is in existence for all the schools. And in fact, um, at the time that the incident occurred, um, Mrs. Carrillo did, did give me a call and we did address her concerns. Um, we did uh, basically agree with her concern about a teacher uh, making a judgment call on a possible head injury. Uh, that is something that we have addressed with the Carrillos. Um, in a, as a follow-up, we did reissue the policy to all of the middle school staff so that they are made aware once again of the existing policy. Um, and in fact, subsequently, when her son had been involved in another incident, we were very sure to contact Mrs. Carrillo as we had discussed and she had wanted us to do. Um, 
And that is pretty much as it stands at this point. And we will continue uh, to follow through with that policy. And when we get individual requests uh, to contact the parent immediately, regardless of what the situation is, we will continue to do that. Is that satisfactory, Mrs. Corral? That you would be, if, if there's any reoccurrence of this, you will be called immediately? Oh, I expect to be called if my child is injured or sick. And my child has become ill at school and thrown up and had a headache. And he was allowed to call me then. But when he was, had a head injury and when he fractured his finger two years ago, he was not allowed to call me or was not told to call me. No one else called me. Well, I understand. He was allowed to remain in school at those times. I understand from now on. From now you, on. You will be called. Yes. Well, what about other parents who might want to be called, but nothing has happened, so this case hasn't come up? I assume that this incident would have uh, would lead us toward being somewhat more conservative in terms of calling for professional assistance and calling the parents. Is it that has accurate. It has. Um, in any case that uh, there has been any question um, that I'm aware of, we have made, been very sure to contact the parents. It, it, is the situation as it will be in the future satisfactory to you, Mrs. Carroll? I know that you're dissatisfied with what's happened in the past. I hope that that will be the case, that when uh, he is, either one of my two children is hurt, they will be allowed to call me. I understand, but we've been assured that they will be, that, that, well, that, that you will be called. I hope so. Well, I hope so too, yeah. and I have no doubt about it. Well, you have no doubt, but that remains to be seen by me. Right, and I another, if, if this was the policy that was supposed to have been followed, I would like to know by what authority te the teacher who did not notify me of the fractured finger or the head injury took it upon themselves not to call me. Well, I think apologies have been made to you. Really? Uh, well, I'll apologize on behalf of the whole school district uh, uh, to you. We're very sorry this has happened. Uh, I don't know more, what more we can do about the past. It's over with. The past is over, that is true. But I think that it is a very dangerous situation when a child is blocked from communicating with his parent while he is at school, and that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think there's a agreement here, and uh, that was in the past, and it's unfortunate. And I will repeat once again, in behalf of the entire Cape Elizabeth School Department, I apologize to you. Thank you. And uh, I'm, we've been assured it won't happen again. Thank you very much. Could I just take one more minute of your time? Sure. Thank you. I just want to make sure that I haven't forgotten anything. Okay. Because this was very serious to me since it was my child. And That's perfectly understandable. Uh, the first incident that occurred when he did have a fractured finger, he was told to go outside and, and stick it in the snow. And um, from what I've heard from a few people, other parents in the town, this is not uncommon when there's um, an injury to tissue, they are told to go out if there's snow on the ground and stick, put snow on it. And this also has to stop. Well, we're certainly and that finger was fractured. In the beginning of the year, I signed a piece of paper that said that in an extreme emergency that the school would be allowed to uh, call an ambulance or have my child treated by a physician if needed and I couldn't be reached or it was an emergency and had to be dealt with immediately. I never gave them permission not to call me for uh, other things and this is what they have done. And I just want you to understand how upset I am and fearful I am that it could happen again because it has happened twice to me. I don't know how many times it's happened to other people. Uh, well, but I'm we, sure it has, and something is wrong. Well, we appreciate your making us uh, aware of it and the time that uh, you spent to come down here and tell us about Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments from the public on any other issues other than the homestay? 
If not, the public comment uh, portion of the meeting is closed. The next item on the agenda is a regular item uh, calling for the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on January 10th, 1989. All the board members have been provided with a copy of those minutes. Uh, after having reviewed them, uh, did you note anything that needed to be modified? If not, I'd entertain a motion. I move that we accept the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a second? Second is made. All in favor signify by raising your hand. All opposed? Minutes are accepted. Uh, next is the business manager's report, D. You want a full report or is this questions? the time? For, is this the is this our quarterly full report? Yeah, no, it isn't. Well, it was last month, but I was yeah. yeah. Sick. What, well, what's your pleasure? Is there anything in the report that you want to ask D about? Well, that uh, revenues are you know pretty much on target. We receive like sixty-two percent of all revenues. Expenditures are being expended at the rate of fifty-seven percent mm -hmm. for the year, or four point four million dollars. Is that uh, ahead or behind the, the real target if you were going to adjust that for leads and lags, the thing that we've talked about in the past? It's pretty much on schedule. Have we made any progress to, uh, in the computer system to get a, a better budget system? We have implemented, as of last month, a month-to-date expenditure report, which I can provide you people. As far as Breaking down the budget on a monthly <coughs> basis, there's no progress there until we look at the system again. Okay. Surprisingly, on page 33, we were up uh, 16 students last month in enrollments, which is pretty good. I'm concerned about the enrollments that are up in some of the particular grades that were already high to begin with, such as seven. Um, are, are we keeping a close eye on on where we are with those as far as numbers of kids and, and our policy? Right to the day, and uh, that's going to be part of our budget discussion. Uh, they are all coming in for additional people, and in some places we did not anticipate because of just what you say, classes are getting too large. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the kindergarten enrollment predictions are 10 over what they should be at this point in time, and we had anticipated 10 less. That's how quickly it changes. Forty higher. Well, this is a guesstimate at this point in time. It's just, but it's far a little too early to really tell. D, uh, do you think that probably we should you should tell the board that uh, we received a Valentine gift today that we didn't anticipate? I guess I guess years ago when the high school was constructed, there was a sinking fund. Uh, interest account or something set up. We got a check today for fifty-two thousand dollars that we didn't expect. Nice Which we'll need. Brilliant <laughs> budgeting. You probably already spent it. <laughs> no, we'll be carried forward to next year's budget. What, what is the debt service that only five percent has been allocated? The all that money will go out April first. See, we pay in November first and uh, April first. November first was the interest. April first is the balance of the uh, 40 some thousand dollars we owed on the high school. And that's the last payment, isn't that's it? That's it. Plus there's a boiler. I guess you people had bored five years ago for boilers at the middle school. That's done this year too. Yeah. Any other questions, D? Uh, if not, we're ready to proceed. I would like to add one, up, one, one thing that I forgot to add. I don't want to panic anyone on this panel. But I have been appointed uh, to the advisory committee of the Department of Education and Cultural Services for gifted and talented <laughs> programs. <laughs> I hope everyone will sleep well tonight. <laughs> Does that require us sending a letter to you to congratulate you for that? <laughs> so far, I've done no harm. <laughs> uh, the next item is a uh, report on the homestay program. As you recall, at the last meeting, we appointed an ad hoc committee
to uh, look into the whole matter of the homestead program. Uh, I, I think just to, to summarize, uh, the board indicated its continuing interest in maintaining an edu edu educational and cultural exchange program for the benefit of the Cape Elizabeth schools. And having made that collective judgment, I think the remaining question is what kind of program to have, uh, what it ought to look like, and how it ought to function. And we uh, asked a, 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 a two school board members, uh, uh, Jan Solon and Peter Leslie, uh, to work with the superintendent uh, and prepare for the board an analysis and, a, and, a, uh, and, and recommendations. Which one of you will uh, start off tonight, uh, Jan? I'll, I'll read the report first. And I think mm -hmm. the, the grounds, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll have the report, uh, some questions of the board, if needed to clarify anything in the, in, in the report so we have an understanding of the report, then um, uh, input uh, from the, uh, any of the administrators and then input uh, from the public and then back to the board for some deliberations. Is that satisfactory? Go ahead, Jim. We looked at the homestay program from two points of view one, educational policy and implementation, and two, financial implications. We concluded that there are multiple benefits to having exchange students in our high school. The presence of a limited number of foreign students, both French and Spanish speaking, benefits our teaching of those languages. We recommend the continuation of our French and Spanish programs with modifications in the Spanish program. Another benefit of foreign students in our midst is the raising of our students' consciousness of other languages and cultures. We feel, therefore, that it would be sound educational policy to also recruit a number of students from countries and cultures beyond those whose languages we teach. This could perhaps be accomplished by participating in an organized, structured exchange program such as AFS. This is not to rule out the ad hoc recruiting that might be accomplished by our school and our town. We also recommend that consideration be given by our language teachers and others at the school on how to better integrate into the curriculum of all CAPE students the cultural knowledge brought to us by the foreign students. At the same time, more attention should be paid to integrating the foreign students themselves into our school and town life. The burden for almost every aspect of the homestay program has fallen on the shoulders of one person, the plan coordinator. This seems to us to be too much for one person and may have been the reason for some rough spots and bad experiences we heard about. To remedy this, we suggest that the existing homestay committee be modified so that it is composed of a board member, the superintendent, the principal, two language teachers, one French, one Spanish, and two or three parents or other interested residents. This committee would formulate policy for all aspects of our homestay program and would also function as an admissions committee. It would determine each year how many exchange students would be admitted and from which countries. Admission standards such as English language proficiency and academic prerequisites would be established by this committee and strictly enforced. Students would not be admitted without basic requirements being met. These would include a host family being lined up well in advance and proven insurance coverage. Our recommendation is that the homestay program admit a maximum of nine foreign students each year. Three of these could come from French-speaking countries and three from Spanish-speaking countries, provided there are no more than two from any country. Three could come from other countries, provided that there be only two per country. If the Spanish and French-speaking quotas are not filled, they may be used by other countries. We recommend that this committee address early on in its work a program to ensure an adequate support system for host families and an attractive program of social and other activities for the exchange students so that their experience in Cape Elizabeth be one that they remember happily all their lives. Our own students should play an important role in these activities. One parent from the new committee might head a subsidiary group which would recruit host parents and help with activities while the foreign students are among us. 
This committee could also supervise the use of our facilities in the summer by the privately operated program and look for opportunities to integrate this program into our social life so that our own students meet the foreign students. This could also provide a source of overseas families for our students to visit. While this is not a Cape Schools program, its use of our facilities certainly provides an opportunity for some mutually beneficial cooperation. We also examine the financial aspects of our program from the point of view of the foreign student and the taxpayer. It costs about $6,500 per student per year to educate a student at Cape Elizabeth High School. We have been charging foreign students $500 or sometimes nothing and virtually all of this goes to the plan coordinator. We receive from the state for each of these students less than $1,000. Without going through time consuming cost analysis, it is probably fair to say that the incremental cost for each homestay student is at least one half our direct cost, say $3,250. We found evidence in several areas in which the homestay student consumed more rather than less of the school's resources than one of our own students. This was evident in the areas of teacher time and administration. Deducting the state's contribution, we concluded that the cost to our town is at least $2,500 per homestay student. We concluded, therefore, that our existing program has the elements of a scholarship program and that our costs exceed our revenues but there is no formal analysis of the foreign student's economic means. Because our program is the least expensive of the 15 we studied, the new committee may want to examine the idea of raising our fees not only to cover more of our costs, but also to bring us into line with what other programs are charging. Our study was completed rapidly, but we did talk to a large number of people. We want to thank them for taking the time to offer their frank appraisals of the past praise for past accomplishments, and constructive suggestions for the future. In conclusion, we recommend that the board approve the immediate formation of a new home state committee so that it will be in place to handle admissions for 1989-1990 and to formulate the policy for the future and its prompt impl implementation. Thank you. Thank you. It's an excellent thorough report. You, you, you obviously spent a lot of time uh, working on this and talking to people and we appreciate the effort you made. Are there any uh, questions from board members on the report itself? I, I have a question. Um, it looks like a committee will make a lot of these decisions. It, it says it's the recommendation of the school board. That, that is, there is flexibility. It, it's a non-binding type of of suggestion that we have three Spanish, three French, and three, or, or is that something well, we're telling them? I think we could uh, do that either way tonight uh, when we get to the stage of deliberations. Uh, it could be left to this committee to digest our report and formulate a policy which I would presume uh, would be somewhat along these lines, but they might decide more or less students or a different distribution. On the other hand, we could, in the deliberations uh, that we're going to have in a few minutes, simply say that is the policy and vote on it. What was your feeling about if some particular year we were not able to fill but the, the, uh, the other country quotas or no one from France came? Would, would we just have less exchange students that year or would we uh, allow more from a, another no, I think we, we mentioned uh, in there, perhaps not clearly enough, that, for example, if there were no French students, uh, those, uh, those spots, as it were, could be filled uh, by students from Yugoslavia, Iceland, Senegal, uh, Right, wherever. but what if, what if no one came from Iceland or Senegal? Could there be more French students? I'm sorry, I thought no French students were coming. No, no, she, she I'm means saying is, is this an the absolute other way. cap? No, is this I'm a cap on Spanish stu students? and French-speaking students? Well, I think that's something we have to decide tonight. Jan and I are only two members of the, uh, the board. Uh, it was our feeling that nine was a good number overall, that uh, three from French and three from Spanish and three from somewhere else would be a proportion that would, uh, that would work. And uh, that was our conclusion. In, in fact, it's our recommendation. But I don't think that it's necessarily, it has to be a by the board 
uh, it could be left to the committee to establish that, uh, although that's not a recommendation. Let, let me just ask you this. W would you put more emphasis on the proportionment or the numbers? I mean, would, would we want nine students here, even if they were all French students, if we, that particular year, were not able to get others, or would we want three French students that year well, and not have the other six because... I think one of the problems uh, that uh, we uh, identified was that when you have nine students from Mexico and Spain, that it's easy for them to get together and speak Spanish. Therefore, they're not, they don't have to make such an effort to integrate themselves into our, into our town and its social life. Uh, by the same tokens, our own students don't have to make the same effort to incorporate that one student from Iceland who doesn't know anything about Cape Elizabeth or the United States. Uh, and, and we felt that uh, that was, uh, it was not a desirable outcome for the nine Spanish-speaking students to spend as much time together as they did. And indeed, in their own questionnaires, and I reread all the questionnaires this morning, uh, and uh, it, was, it was striking how often the, uh, the students themselves from Mexico and Spain uh, said in their, you know, in answering the question, how would you change the program? They said, achieve more diversity. I think that's also one of the reasons that, that we clearly put in here that, um, you know, provided there are no more than two from any country or because that, that was a major consideration and a major point in what, what we found out, so the diversity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We're going to have an opportunity to, uh, to discuss this afterward as well, but if you've got the clarification questions now, we'll give them. Any other questions? Of the oh, I would just say, first, uh, I'm, I'm impressed with the report, and uh, I think it's very feasible. For example, I was called uh, last week by the Japanese Association, who said they would like to form their own uh, uh, group and uh, get their own families and uh, get their own insurance, and would we take any of their students if, we, if they presented them? And I was able to indicate uh, that uh, we had a committee that was reporting this evening, and we would uh, send them a copy of the report or what decisions were made after this meeting. Uh, the Chinese associations approached me with something similar to that. So it appears to me that uh, this might be very feasible, and I think you know how I feel in terms of globalness. And I think the larger the diversity, the, the, the better it would be for our own children. So I compliment uh, the board members on a good report. Okay, what, uh, what we'll do now is uh, we'll have input uh, from anybody who's sitting in the audience. Uh, we're going to have a time limit, though, because uh, uh, there are a lot of people out there, and we have a lot of work to do tonight. And uh, so I think five minutes per person would be fair, and I think... Uh, uh, you stand up and make your points uh, succinctly. Why don't we see how many want to speak, and then we'll have an idea of the time limit. One, two, three, four, five. Phyllis, did you raise your hand too? Well, I I, uh, well shall we count it? Five. Huh? Six. Six. All right. Okay, why don't, why don't, Dara, you want to begin? You want to be first? Is that why you're raising your hand? You'll be first. You should be first. Please, uh, each person uh, uh, identify themselves. My name is Dara Say from a senior at Cape High School, and I participated in the home state program. I went to Spain for three weeks last year, and I had, we had an exchange student at our house this summer who was from the family that I stayed with. <clears throat> My comments are kind of general, the first thing that I'd like to say, just that I heard that at the last school board meeting, after a lot of us, a lot of the same people who are here tonight, 
had come and spoken in support and and in criticism of the program after we had left you reopen the subject and people who had who had complaints were allowed to allowed to make them and we weren't here to give you the rest of the story and i don't know what the format is for school board meetings usually but that's just kind of disturbing to me because i wonder what the attitude is of I mean, or what or what the motives are behind examining the homestay program if that kind of thing could happen where it's in, it almost seemed like like they didn't want to say it in front of us because we were here, but then you let them after the subject had been closed. Uh, Dara, could I clarify that Certainly. for you? I'd like uh, we have a public comment period where we reserve time in each school board meeting for the public to comment. Uh, when we were discussing, the public comment period had not yet come on the agenda when we were discussing the homestay program. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I was very flexible that night. People wanted to, did not want to, some people did not want to wait until the public comment period. They said, can I come up and speak? So rather than say, no, you cannot come up and speak, and there's a time on the agenda for public comment, mm -hmm. I said, okay, come on up. Now in retrospect, given the criticism that I've received for it, I think probably what I should have said is, no, you can't speak now. We have a time on the, on the, on the schedule here and you'll have to do it then. But I was flexible. Now what happened was that unbeknownst to me, because there are no conspiracies here. There were people out there, when we got to the public comment period, I said, does anybody wish to speak about anything? And some people came to the podium and said, yes, we want to speak about something. And they spoke about the homestay program. Now, I don't see how that could be helped other than uh, you know, to be inflexible, as probably I should have been, inflexible and told all of you who wanted to speak while we were discussing the subject, no, wait until the public comment period. Thank you. That was a misunderstanding. It just it just seemed that that it would have it would have been clearer or more accurately represented if everyone had spoken at the same time, either during the home state topic or at the public uh, well, I'd like offering to section. That's all. That's that was my misunderstanding. I apologize for it. I, I'd like to it. comment on that because uh, uh, it's not a debating society uh, as far as hearing public comments are concerned. In other words, you get up and say you're for something, and somebody gets up and says they're against it. You get up, you have your five minutes to speak now. Somebody else will have five minutes to express a contrary opinion. But you normally wouldn't get up again and express a contrary opinion to that one and then that person get up again. What we heard that night as board members were some opinions that said this and some opinions that said that and some other opinions that said something in the middle. Uh, you weren't all sitting in the room at the same time, but basically we heard as we're supposed to hear as board members, several different points of view. All right, the other thing that I wanted to say was that as far as, I kind of echo what Mrs. Pond was asking you about, about percentages versus the numbers, that I think it might be a better idea to concentrate on the ratio instead of limiting it to nine numbers because, because people, it seems from listening to what people have said at the last meeting that one of the big motives for having students in your home is to help your kid who is taking that particular language. And since we don't offer Japanese or Russian or Chinese or, or Sri Lankan or any of those things that you're talking about, I think you're going to have a lot of trouble finding people to host people, kids from those countries. So you don't want to, just because, just because people can't come from those countries, put a cap on Spanish-speaking countries. Also, um, because of the link that Mr. Perez has established and because Central America is so much closer to us than Japan is, you're going to have, you're just going to have a natural imbalance, and I don't think that's necessarily bad. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Robert Tinsman. I'm a senior at Cape Elizabeth High School as well. Um, next week I'm going to Spain for three weeks as a result of this homestay program, which probably wouldn't have come, come um, through if I hadn't taken five years of Spanish at, in the high, four years in high school, one year in eighth grade. But um, I, w I want to just echo Dara's point about the ratio policy here. It seems like um, money is a big issue in this, in this report, and I don't know if it should be an issue because some of the things we take out of this program, the resources we get out of the kids themselves, is priceless. We, c we, we can't put a price on it. The, the relationships we've made, Maybe if only four Mexicans came, 
and that one that didn't come that would have helped 30 kids from the high school. I mean, there's a lot of ifs here, but um, just the, the personal issue here, like what, what, what happens in calculus? Someone shows a new way to do this, this one example or something, which has happened. Mr. Richards was even showed something new by some, some of the Mexican students who have had calculus before. And I mean, that was just something that showed our class a whole new issue of thinking about things in other countries. Um, I don't know if, what I'm trying to say is, I don't know if we can put a price on the, the things we can get out of these people that are coming to visit. And I don't know if, um, the racial part's interesting, but I don't know if we should just say it strictly limit it to this number. If we can get people from other countries, it's great. But with Capos as being such a sheltered community, I don't know if they're going to be all, okay, three people, three um, French, three Spanish, and three others. Um, it would be nice to assume we could get other, other families to take these people from Yugoslavia or whatever, but um, I don't, just don't know if it can happen. It would be great if it could. But I don't know if, if, we should be able, if we should put this strict guideline down for this. That's just my point. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'm Eileen Gelinas, and I just have a comment on the report. I believe that you said that uh, because everything fell on one person as it stands now, that there were some rough spots. And quite possibly this is true because this is our first year being involved in it. But one of the rough spots that was mentioned uh, by the, one of the people that spoke at the last meeting um, was that there was not enough supervision. And I know this is one rough spot that's been straightened out because we have monthly meetings now. The host families meet with Mr. Perez in his homeroom. So, you know, I just wanted to make this clear that uh, probably some of the rough spots that have been, uh, that you folks have been told about have already been straightened out in, in this program. Uh, because actually I haven't found any rough spots at all. It's been an extremely positive experience for me and my whole family. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm Bob Wagstaff. I talk about the financial part a little bit. Uh, I have a friend who's the EF coordinator for the EF program in the area. He is uh, Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, Scarborough. And uh, there's no money coming from that program to any, any school system at all. So these figures here are still going to be there. Our cost per student will always be cost per student, whether it's EF program, AFS program, or our own program. And it costs uh, an EF student program $3,500 to $4,000 a year to get in that program. And the area coordinator, who has those three towns, he gets $200 per student. And he's not even in the school system. He's a good computer programmer. Uh, our program, we've had in the past with Juan Perez, he may get $500 per student, but he's right here in our school. He's right here in Cape Elizabeth. He lives here. He's very accessible. So I think that has to be considered uh, as far as the financial aspect of the whole thing. There, there, there's no money going to school whatsoever from any of these programs. I mean, all that $3,500 that's all administrative money. If we ran our own program, we could we could charge that kind of money, maybe. I doubt it. Do the do the, st do the students uh, are there any programs where the students pay uh, a tuition to go? Not that I know of. It's all one package. It includes the airfare, the whole bit. They they gave everything for them, you know, as far as and the area coordinator here in, in this in this area, his job is to find homes for these people. He interviews the parents, talks to the school systems, and that kind of thing. But that's it. I mean, he gets $200 per student for doing that, and he places them. If there's a problem, he has to take care of the problem. He has to move the kid or whatever, find a new, new home for him. And that's the way that works. So the family of the exchange student may pay 2000 or 3000 or whatever for their kid to come to the United States, but none of those dollars find their way into the host school system. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. That is correct. The school system has the kid, and that's it. You know, they got him, and the 
the host family has the kid, and that's the way it works. And that's the way it works here, really. It's, it, it depends on the, uh, the motivation of the, of the parents who are hosting the, uh, the child and the child that the student's living with. If they're not totally committed to the program, it's not going to work because the, the kids in Cape Elizabeth aren't going to put their arms out and take care of these kids. When my daughter and son both had exchange students, and we forced them and said, I want you to exchange, you're going to do everything with them. I mean, you can't go out and date, you can't work, you can't do anything. You're gonna, it's a commitment for a whole school year. You're going to make sure that, that this boy or girl, whatever, can find their way around Cape Elizabeth and has a, you know, gets as much as he, he or she can get out of this whole program. And that's the way it has to be. And you can't go call Juan Perez or whoever's a coordinator and, you know, every, every little thing. It doesn't work that way. You've got to be dedicated to this thing for it to work. If you're not, it's not going to work. No matter how many you have on a committee, it's not going to make any difference. You can set up some guidelines, which I think are good. And we came to this program in 1983, and things have changed 100% for the better. But it's mostly because the school's gotten involved a little bit where they weren't before. Our first exchange student, a girl, she spent most of her time sitting in the cafeteria because she couldn't get any, any hard classes she wanted to get into. Our last exchange student last year took calculus, physics, English, American history, and French one, and 91 average. You know. The kids can do it, they're smart, but you have to give them the chance to do it. You have to get, let them in the classes. And in that respect, the program's come around 100% since our first involvement with it. That's all I have. Any questions of Bob? Okay, thanks. My name's Don Sanborn, and we have our third exchange student with us right now, who happens to be the young lady from uh, Norway. And I find that the report that Jan gave tonight be quite objective. But one of the parts that I would like to talk about is the quality of student that Juan has brought to the United States. And I only can speak for the three that we have had, but we found them to be extremely supportive in the home. They were good students. They were supportive in the community in that they participated in sports activities, that they also took on uh, babysitting jobs with families. Uh, the student we had last year earned about $4,000 uh, on a part-time job babysitting. And she did not need the money. She came from a very wealthy family. So I would like to reiterate, the, reinforce the program as being one that should be continued at Cape Elizabeth. And the quota system, I'm in favor of from the standpoint of a ceiling, but I'm not sure I'm in favor of from a, a mixture of French, Spanish, Norwegian, Sweden students. I think I would prefer to see the quota mix deferred to the committee. And I think the committee idea is extremely excellent uh, and should have probably been instituted a long time ago. That's all I have. <laughs> I'm interested. You have a Norwegian student? We have a Norwegian student, yes. Now, has, has that experience been as positive as, as having uh, a student Spanish. who spoke a language that perhaps your child was taking at the time? Uh, I would say yes. Totally different individuals, though. Uh, the two students that we had last year, one in the fall and one in the spring, came from Oaxaca, Mexico. They were Spanish. And there was an opportunity for my daughter to go back to Mexico for four weeks last summer, an opportunity that we probably couldn't have paid for if she did not stay with a family down there. So not only did we have students in our home, my daughter had an opportunity to go to Mexico. And she is also leaving next Tuesday in the Spain program. Uh, Venke, uh, being Norwegian, is not hanging around as they would say in high school, with the Spanish students. She has sort of sought out her own friends, uh, both male and female, and sort of really runs in a totally different circle and has integrated into the community in a different manner than the Spanish students. So I guess I'm saying, yes, I do advocate different countries. As a matter of fact, I asked Juan if, this was last spring, if a student you know, showed interest from another foreign country, we would be interested in hosting that individual. So 
I specifically, along with my daughter, sought out a student other than a Mexican student, even though we had very positive experiences with the two we had last year. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Phyllis Wagstaff. I just wanted to mention one thing about the beauty of the program that no one's mentioned. The fact that you have the brothers and the sisters and the cousins coming. coming. You have more than a one little student that comes, you see them, you have a good time, they go. Like when Jennifer was a sophomore, her best friend was a girl named Susanna, and we ended up last year having her brother. And I think it just brings us closer to the town in Mexico, the, the certain towns, to know the community, to have a group of people. And I think people, kids that have had students, and then they see these other kids coming, and the brothers, cousins, friends of the other kids, and I just think there's a tie there that you don't necessarily see in another program. So that's the one plus that I don't think has been mentioned. Thank you, Phyllis. Next. Good evening, I'm uh, Benson Dana, and I'd just like to uh, to say that uh, it seems like nobody has any problems with the homestay program per se. It's, uh, any kind of exchange program seems to be an extremely positive type of uh, activity, uh, but uh, I just like to say I support the, the idea of the uh, uh, broadening the base of administ administration of the program that's uh, been presented. And I think that's, uh, that's just uh, common sense, and I don't think anybody has uh, uh, expressed any reservations to that, to that uh, part of the proposal, so I just wanted to lend my support to that. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Uh, my name's Mark Woodward, and uh, we had an exchange student stay with us for a year um, last year. And for our family, it was uh, extremely positive. Uh, I would like to just uh, reinforce a couple of the comments that were uh, mentioned tonight. I think that uh, there is a special relationship that can develop with uh, some of the students, and uh, uh, the student we had, his brother came the following year and stayed uh, with a neighbor next door, and uh, we are in hopes uh, perhaps that his uh, sister might come and uh, spend a year. So we. We also sent our son over, and he spent three weeks uh, in Spain with that family, and uh, there has become a little more depth to this whole process than just uh, sending a child over, and, and uh, this reciprocal uh, agreement, I think, works out pretty well. I think the other important thing that's happened with the whole program is you've had an individual that has taken a personal uh, interest in the program and has promoted it strongly and has worked uh, what I perceive, anyway, uh, very hard to keep the thing viable. And obviously, any program of this kind where you're dealing with this number of people is going to have rough spots. And uh, I don't think uh, perhaps expanding the administration is going to be a good idea. I don't think that that's going to make sure that you don't have any rough spots. Uh, they, will, they will continue. But uh, uh, I think the, the program should be encouraged. Um, I would, I think that there is potentially uh, some difficulties if you get students that can group together and they aren't forced to integrate themselves into the community. Um, that's a hazard and, and maybe there are other ways to deal with that other than just limiting the number of students uh, from a particular area or a particular uh, uh, language. I think that uh, it's important to integrate them in the community. It's important for us to, uh, to both become involved uh, with each other. So that's a question and that's a concern. I'm not sure uh, what the best way to resolve that one is. But uh, I think overall, uh, we would be very supportive of the program. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
Other comments? Uh, be, be, before we uh, begin our deliberations up here, I want to uh, thank every person who spoke. Uh, all the comments were succinct, uh, to the point, uh, courteous, and helpful. We appreciate that very much. Uh, in order to, uh, to move the matter ahead here, uh, as chairman, I would like to move that the school board uh, adopt uh, as its policy uh, the tenets of the report that have been submitted by Jan and Peter, uh, the essence of which uh, is a committee approach uh, to admissions and uh, the form of the program and overseeing the program. Uh, I make that motion. If there's a second, we can have discussion on that. Second. Motion has been made and second. Now. <coughs> In the paragraph you read where it says this committee will formulate policy for all aspects of our home stay program and would also function as an admissions committee. It would determine each year how many exchange students would be admitted and from which country. Mm -hmm. So I think that gives them a parameter and some flexibility in the way to operate the program. I think we can suggest these um, these numbers, but I, I'm wondering if we should leave the final decision to them. I think one of the reasons that we wrote it in this form was that our feeling was that if it were going to be done by a committee, that it might be difficult if we said this is written in stone and this is what you have to do, um, that there should be some flexibility for the committee to make these kinds of decisions. But from everything that we saw and heard, um, what made the most sense to us was the maximum of nine with these limitations. Is that the way you'd like for us to adopt this? With the specific? I think it's fair to point out that this was one of the more difficult subjects that we had to deal with. And uh, as you could tell from the comments you heard tonight, uh, people make a very persuasive case for having an exchange program with Oaxaca, Mexico only and with whole families coming here and studying and it is a persuasive case. Uh, equally persua persuasive cases can be made for diversity and uh, I just wanted to point out that this was a difficult issue for, for Jan and me and for the many people with whom we spoke. So the question I think before us is, uh, do we constitute the committee and give them some latitude or do we accept this and uh, with the limitation without our knowing for sure whether we can recruit three French students for yeah. one year. I mean, uh, you know, I, think we, I think I anyway want to confess that, you know, the, the limitations of a 30-day study uh, Peter, can I, can I suggest something? You know, the school board can adopt this as policy. The committee can set to work. Uh, I can guarantee you that, uh, talented as both of you are, no, no, no report and no set of guidelines is perfect. Everything is subject to change. If we amend the Constitution of the United States, we certainly can amend this. Uh, you're right. So, uh, well, also, I, I think with the committee set up the way it is, you'll have a French teacher on the committee. You'll have a principal on the committee. The superintendent will be on the committee. A board member. Uh, a board member will be on the committee, and three interested community members. I, I think you'll have a, a fairly well-rounded group of people that would would uh, certainly want diversity in the program. Yeah, because they're represented by diverse uh, groups. I, I want and for adoption of the report. And then, look, if, if, we, if it's six months or three months or three weeks after the committee has begun to function, they come back here and say, you know, this is, you adopted this as, you know, your, your, your report and, 
and policy, here's why it doesn't work. Uh, and you've got to change this and this. Fine. But let's try this. The only way to move ahead with some direction and some focus <coughs> is to have this level of detail in the report so that the committee at least has a direction. And again, I'm not adverse to the committee coming back and saying, we read what you said, okay. but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also another point in the report that's pointed out about the cost factor, which I think the committee is going to have to look at and come back with a recommendation as to if there is a cost, is it a scholarship program, uh, should the school system be reimbursed for, you know, part of the cost of educating the students. So that's, I think there are a couple of things here that the committee is going to have to yeah. review. I think the, the gentleman who made that observation uh, made a very accurate one. Uh, what we were thinking of at the time was that uh, if there were more money available for uh, for support for the program, uh, for more recreation, more trips, et cetera. It might work better. It might feel better for the, uh, the host parents and the uh, exchange students. Uh, it wasn't, uh, and it is, you know, in rereading it, it isn't particularly clear. It, I don't think we ever discussed, did we, Jan, the idea of the money actually going into the school? Uh, because I, I mean, maybe we should have, but we didn't. Any further discussion? If not, the motion has been made and seconded, and we all understand that the, well, let me, just one, one question. Uh, if we adopt this, I assume what we want is to invite people to, who want to serve on the committee. And we've got principal, superintendent, school board <coughs> member, and two or three, and let's just say three to begin with, because there seems to be a lot of people interested in this. Uh, three others, besides the Spanish teacher and the French teacher, to serve on this committee. Invite them to, as quickly as possible, call Daryl Pelletier on the phone or send him a note, say you want to be considered uh, for this committee. And spread the word, if the people he that are not here, that you think might be interested, spread the word to them to give their name to uh, Daryl. All right, uh, if there's not any further discussion, uh, you all remember the motion? Mm -hmm. All in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand. All opposed, uh, it's a vote. Uh, the uh, next item is uh, selection of library materials and a, uh, a policy with respect to a selection of library materials. And from time to time, uh, there are people who complain about books that are in a library. Uh, very touchy issue. Supreme Court cases on the issue. Carol, why don't you explain the policy? All right, first, uh, this year in Maine, Maine schools and libraries have increased sharply since school began in September in terms of censorship. Nine schools, one public library, have reported censorship incidents to the chair of Intellectual Freedom Committee for the Maine Library Association and the Maine Educational Media Association. The uh, books this year uh, that have drawn this kind of attention have been Birdie, Wharton's Birdie, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, Go Ass Alice, and George Orwell's 1984. Uh, I have uh, reviews of all those, if anybody wants to know what they're all about. They're old book, by the way. Now, the Intellectual Freedom Committee is extremely concerned. Uh, we discussed this a year ago. And to date, at least I can say, none of the complaints have led to books or films being permanently removed from the library. Uh, however, I think it's time, and we've had some indications this year, to have a policy that deals with this. And this policy has been reviewed, carefully reviewed with the librarians. Uh, it, some of it has been drawn from the associations and other school systems. And you'll note it deals closely with the School Library Bill of Rights, the objectives of selection, the criteria, special considerations, and more importantly, how we would deal with challenged materials. And uh, I'm presenting it tonight as the first reading and would bring it to you a month from now and hope that it becomes permanent policy in two months. Uh, so that 
if we do have material that's challenged, uh, we have machinery or a venue for handling. All right. I'm still looking for my policy. I can't get in here. I've, I've looked at it, but in the meantime, while I'm coming through my papers, anybody have any comments? Have there been any instances in the CAPE system where we've had complaints about materials that have been in the library at this point? We have had one incident this year, which was handled by the superintendent and the chairman of the board. Uh, I might add, handled quite positively from my point of view. Well, we had a very positive parent raising the issue, too, right. constructively. Right. Um, what about uh, where in here is, uh, there, there, there are, you know, I'm a member of the ACLU and the MCLU, which would probably mean that I would never get reelected this board if I, uh, <laughs> but uh, since I'm getting off, I can now publicly announce that. Uh, <coughs> card carrying member, no doubt, too. Card carrying, absolutely. But, uh, it seems to me there are, there are inappropriate materials that you know may be available to third graders or second graders or fourth graders uh, who are not you know it's not a question of freely dealing with ideas in their cases. Uh, that was the case that we confronted. Right. Our, uh, where in this thing does it say that you know somebody has to look at this stuff to see if it's appropriate? for a third grader. We're not talking about politics here, we're talking about sex. I think, uh, I, I think uh, basically it's in the responsibility for selection, which in turn becomes the uh, professionally trained media personnel people. Uh, E.g., one of our problems we have to be careful with is we have a middle school with eighth graders in it, and the library really presently is four through eight. And there are times when a book might be put at the top shelf rather than at the bottom, because it might be very suitable for an eighth grader and not too suitable for a fourth grader. And I think that's the librarian's uh, work, and that's easily handled, I'm sure, uh, because we've had very few incidents, uh, at least since I've been here. But uh, that's where it is, Mr. Chairman, right there. Uh, yeah. Rest with the media people, or the librarians, as we call them. <coughs> okay, any other comments? Well, I, I actually, I do. I, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but th this deals with censorship, people that want a book removed. Right. What happens, uh, what's the criteria for having a book in the library that the librarian or a committee thought was unsuitable? Would they not have rights to? Yes, and what we do, if it's in the library, if it's in the library and it's challenged, we want to know what aspect of it is challenged, and this committee at the third page would determine, you know, whether or not it should be removed or not, or sent to another school or a higher level or that sort of thing. But it would rest with this committee. However, uh, we would not remove, you know, the Supreme Court in Ohio uh, said that boards uh, cannot remove any materials from uh, libraries. Uh, the key is to, to use balance on the selection. And I suspect, and I've talked to our librarians, generally the Library Association, the English Teachers Association, and a number of associations from time to time will endorse books. And as they look at the reviews, you know, they'll see if they're endorsed. Uh, I am certain that we don't have a librarian that would put Boccaccio's The Camera in our library. You know, on college campuses, it's, it's, on the, it's in the cellar, locked. So. Yeah, but what if someone came and demanded that that book be on the shelf? Uh -huh. I mean, then is, is we would consider a... it, and we could say as a committee, that's not suitable for our population. And, uh, you know, and then they could take us to court, I'm sure. So this works both ways. Sure. I mean, if somebody wants Playboy magazine among the, I mean, yep. that goes, can be challenged the same way. Right, and we would yep. say that's not suitable, not in line with our goals, or we don't feel that the, I won't say that, the authors <laughs> will get that. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, you know, in the month that you have a chance to really absorb it. Uh, however, it's been tested in a number of places, and I'd be more than happy to, you know, check those places and what's happened. I want to uh, demonstrate uh, the fact that I was flexible last time that we met on the homestay program, and I did take people out of order because we're all citizens of the same community here. So, Dara, stand up and tell us what you wanted. Sit up the microphone, the microphone. <laughs> I just wanted to know what your criteria is for something that's suitable. Do you have, do you have something written out or is that something that you take instance by instance? Is this like the pornography thing where you have a, a legal definition for obscenity or something? How are you doing this? Would you like to, uh, if Chairman, could yeah. I read the criteria? Would, would you please? All right, uh, uh, this is, uh, first the overall purpose, timeliness, permanence, importance of the subject matter, quality of the writing, production, aesthetic appeal, readability, popular appeal, authoritativeness, very important to us in the schools, reputation of the publisher, producer, reputation significance of the author, artist, composer, format, and lastly, because we have to deal with Monique Price. That's pretty much it. Uh, however, it might please you to know that uh, The review of questioned material shall be treated objectively in an important matter. The best interest of the students and the curriculum and the school and the community, community shall be paramount in consideration. All parties should bear in mind the principle of the student's right to read, which may take precedence over personal opinion. Parties should also keep in mind the philosophy of Cape Elizabeth schools in preparing students for citizenship and a democracy. Now that's pretty much broad stroke criteria. Okay. Uh, this is the second? Is this the second reading? First reading. First reading. First reading. All right. We'll have the first reading. We'll have the second reading next time, right? Right. Okay, any comments? Peter? No. Uh, all right. Any other business that any members of the, the board no. wish to bring before the board? Two resignations, sir. Two resignations. They are art teacher Lorraine Williams at the middle school and Cynthia McOsker, who is a special ed at the Pond Cove. All right. Uh, we have the two uh, resignations. Is there a motion to accept them? Second. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Opposed? Okay. Uh, if there's no other business, uh, yes, there is other business. I am reminded. <laughs> the, only, the only reason I'm addressing you is because I thought during open agenda time some parents that I've been dealing with at the elementary school were going to come and present a, a special request to the board. Could, could I introduce you to oh, the sorry. television audience Please. as Mrs. Barbara Powers, who is the principal? I call you the principal uh, of, you, of the elementary school. I should have done that myself, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, we have had some discussions over the past couple weeks concerning uh, their concerns about our transportation exclusion of certain neighborhoods, that we do have probably 30 to 40 children in the elementary level who walk to and from school. Um, that we have been requested of late to provide transportation to particular of these children. Um, and it was my understanding that that required um, board approval to increase our area of transportation, and, and I was sharing that with them. Um, meanwhile, Daryl was operating on a policy that he located that assures that transportation can be provided when requested. So at this point, be because um, folks in the television audience didn't come tonight because I assured them that this was all set, I'm, I'm feeling a need to represent them and to say that um, we have come to clarification on this point with the Director of Transportation, with Daryl's blessing, and, and are planning to send a memorandum out to our walking population this week to offer, indeed, rides to and from school. So if any of you are called on this matter, you can assure them that we're addressing it and that the request will be honored immediately following February break. Thank you, Bob. Is that only at the elementary school level? That's the only area we've addressed. Is okay. that policy only true of the elementary school? Upon the policy you're 
No, it would be every. We would certainly consider anything anybody else, but we've never had any request no for school. anybody else. It's the youngsters that are across the road from the school. That a lot of them are going to walk when they want to. And the high school people, as you know, use cars. I think uh, there's I something about not using the bus that you're mm -hmm. <laughs> you, You've never had a request from fourth graders that live in Brentwood? Or? This is frankly new this year, and it, and it came up in a situation where there is bus transportation, as you know, provided to all kindergartners. So three-quarter empty buses were depositing children at the end of a day in a neighborhood where there were parents very interested in having their first and second graders also brought home. So we allowed informally for that situation to occur, occur and now they're requesting uh, pickup and drop-off. Okay. It's a very new request this year. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. All right. Any other comments? If not, uh, we'll consider uh, the request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Is there such a motion? To enter executive session. Motion has been made to enter executive session. It was seconded by Jan Solon. All in favor? Oh. 